So I want to start off with some real basic concepts. Um, a key concept of any good problem solving is the ability to effectively gather information. The more effectively you can gather information, the more effectively you can solve your problems. Um, so it's real helpful to start off with just being able to use search engines. That'll make a huge difference in your ability to gather information quickly. You'll be less likely to get jackass answers from people like me on forums who think you should have used a search engine. So if we want to search just a wiki or just a forum or if we want to search both of them, we can kind of search in this site notation on Google and most search engines will probably accept this or something similar and then come up with whatever we need to tell us how to do what we're trying to do, you know. So another good source of information is the Cheat Engine Wiki itself. Um, it's got a fair amount of stuff to it. Looking at the tutorial section, um, it's got a fair amount of just the basic stuff on here to start off with. Uh, value type pointers, a stack, AOB, some of that I'm going to be talking about. Um, but then it even goes over the Cheat Engine tutorials and how to do that. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about value types. Um, in computing there really are no value types, it just depends upon how the process uses the bits it reads to tell it what, you know, dictates what type it is. Um, that you really just gotta look at the code to really understand exactly what it's doing. Most of the time though when you're searching for values you're just gonna kinda make a guess and see if that works out for you but you will sometimes find where if you start seeing it's using signed instructions say for its comparisons and stuff like that then you go ahead and use it at you know view it as a signed value if it's an integer whereas if you see it's not using any kind of signed instructions then you go ahead and leave it as just an unsigned integer so basically there the thing to worry about is you know just the bits bytes and words to begin with um, bits are obviously the base units that all computers use. It's a binary format and it's just zero or one is all it could ever be. Um, they're, today they're usually done with transistors but uh, more or less it's a switch. It used to literally be switches way back when. So basically the base value types you're gonna need to worry about are like your bits, bytes, and words. Um, a bit is the base unit of computers. It's you know binary digit and it can only be zero or one. It basically represents the actual transistors. Um, think of it like a switch is what a transistor basically is. But then on up to the bytes you've got they hold eight bits and because of the way the math works out basically two 2 to the 8th power equals 256. That gives you a possibility of 0 to 255. While if it's signed, that does change its behavior to where it'd be negative 128 to 127. Uh, right at first, you really want to worry too much about signed values. Uh, some stuff will have that, but again, it's not going to be a huge issue you'll find. Most of the time I don't even really pay attention until I actually see a number that looks like it's too big to make sense for the value, but it makes a lot of sense if it was a signed value. And then just leap you to sign if it seems like it adds up, then that's about it. So then you've got your words. Um, basically those used to be more or less the base unit. It was based on the actual processor size. They kind of quit updating what word meant to just be backwards compatible with other stuff. But, so your underlying word is just two bytes. Not real complicated. I don't actually, I'd have to look it up to see what kind of values it can hold, but it's 16 bits. Um, and then after that you've got what would be a standard integer basically. It's um, known as a double word or a D word even. And then it's your four bytes, 32 bits. Well, that's one of the more standard value sizes you'll see a lot of. Um, not many things really break it down into word or byte unless the engine's really optimized or something like that. And so then you've got your Q words, um, quad word. Basically it's 8 bytes, 64 bits. Um, that's more of a 64-bit process kind of thing. 
Then you have your float types, um, basically single precision and double precision. Um, single precision would be a D word more or less, it's just four bytes. The double precision is just double, double that size, so it's just a Q word, eight bytes. After that, it's basically just your text and strings. Um, I really don't do much with any of that. AOBs, you'll probably want to use a lot of for searching for stuff. More signatures than AOB at some point, but but AOB is just a array of bytes. Um, it's more for searching for opcode and stuff like that to find injection points. Another key thing to understand is pointers and just what they are. Um, basically, it's kind of its own value type in some sense, but it's just a pointer will only ever hold a memory address, so its size is always dictated by the process size. Um, so a 64-bit process, it'll be a single word, 16-bit, uh, two bytes for any pointer. Normally, you're going to be working with either 64-bit or 32-bit. So in 32-bit, it's a 32-bit size, um, a D word more or less. Um, and then 64-bit, it's 64-bit keyword. Um, the other concept to understand with pointers is that to some extent when you're working with one at its base, you're more thinking about the object, you know. So it's, you might have, say, when they write a program or a game, they actually create a class or an object that's player and then they give it a name and health and coins and coordinates. You can make that an object with an X, Y, Z and then go on to you know, an inventory array and it can get more and more complicated. So then actually looking at it at this object in memory, we might have a you know our base pointer that we find that actually points to the player base object. So then you'd actually read what this value or what this address holds in the size of the process. So in this case, let's say it's a you know D word. We're looking at a 32-bit process. And so when we actually read that address and then we add plus 10 that actually points to where our name is going to be stored. And again, a string will pretty much always be a pointer. It'll just, because it doesn't want to take up an unknown amount of room. But then it points to that string and, you know, some information is stored above the string, but then the string itself is stored at plus four of that object. The string object, more or less. Um, then after that, let's say we've got our plus 14 and that might point to where our health actually is and that might actually be our health and not just point to a health object but it could even be another pointer pointing to a health object if there is you know if that's how they've coded it so an example of an even more complicated you know class setup or structure setup would be if they have a you know a player base that inherits from actor base and then it's got its you know the name and the health and coins and whatever else after that. But that's where you might see it actually buried a little deeper than it would make sense just right off the bat. But it's, you know, oftentimes you have it where it inherits from this to inherit from that and the underlying language. And it just, they can structure it in a lot of different ways. It may still be like this and just have it stored up up here right in the first bit of the the structure to tell it, you know, this is what it inherits from, this is where its function table is, this is where, you know, this is, and it, again, it just depends upon the compiler and then ultimately even the engine itself and just how it stacks everything up and deals with the objects. The main thing to really keep in mind with pointers is they just quite simply point at a, some other object, um, and that's just a way to deal with objects in memory. Is really if you start just talking integers and floats and whatnot, it's you're you're gonna run out of ways to deal with stuff. This makes it a lot easier in the programming language itself. You know that's why object-oriented programming is rather popular. So another good topic to understand is registries, kind of just what they are and how they're used and all that kind of thing. Um, this will be how pretty much everything is moved and dealt with. It, it's just it's how the processor itself works and how it deals with the data going through it. So originally there was just 16-bit registries. You still have access to those. Um, 
and then it kind of went up from there as processor size went up basically we got 64 bits so that tends to be kind of the primary one they do have some supplementary ones that add to the system to make especially dealing with floating points of different types and even um different structures and stuff like that and that's going to be the simd registries those are your your xmm registries is usually how you'll really see them denoted um and then they're just numbered zero zero through uh, i think nine or something on 32 bit and then 64 bit goes clear up to 15. Um, but the general purpose registries are the primary ones you're going to see used and really deal with on a regular basis because they'll they work for the pointers they work for everything i mean and really you can even still do stuff with floats and whatnot if you're just moving values around but to access the other underlying parts so we have eax which basically stands for the um extended accumulator registry ax was its original setup so that's for just your accumulator registry and then you got your cx or the count registry um, it usually uses a counter you'll often see functions use it as a base address i mean it just kind of depends on the compiler and then even the engine and just how stuff is set up within it um, and then bx would be your base index um, usually used with arrays is your data registry um, and then you've got your si your source index it's usually for strings and then di is your destination index you know um, when you start getting into these ones that end in p uh, a lot of times you kind of end up staying away from those at least at first until you really understand them um, so sp is your stack pointer and then you've got a stack base pointer and then the instruction pointer and that one you really don't ever want to mess with um, there are some scenarios to do with certain things with that but it's just i don't even really understand how to do that stuff so i won't be going over that and then 64 bit you'll have there's another eight registries that just they're just numbered and there was no real purpose you know specific purpose set up for it um, basically it's r8 through r15 but they are useful in 64 bit when you're dealing with larger and larger objects so here we just see kind of a visualization of how to deal with you know not only their sizes but kind of where it's placed in memory um, so obviously our the R whatever X is going to be the full, it will be a full 64 bits. Um, even if you are in a 64 bit program, you can just do the E and that'll only use the first 32 bits. And then same thing with, you know, cutting out the extended part and then it'll just be the word, to the, you know, the 16 bits. And then you can actually get the high or the low. Um, when you're dealing with the um, general purpose registries, the ones that aren't, don't, you know, have, you know, that are just numbered. Um, those you can access the lower parts with like R15, you know, if you were on R15 up here, you know, for 64 bit, but you want to just use a D word for it, you can actually just do R15D and then R15W and then R15B for the lowest byte. You really can't get the high byte on that. They don't have that set up, at least not that I've ever seen yet. And then kind of lastly, what I'll talk about with the registries is the flag registry. Um, you really won't use that necessarily, but it's more when you're looking, if you're looking up a compare, you might see where it's telling you what it's going to set, you know, under what condition it will set the, the carry flag or the parity flag or just, you know, the zero flag is one that often gets checked and what, you know, this way you can kind of understand what's going on with that compare and why it might not be working out the way you think it is and it can help with troubleshooting problems more or less and then understanding how the compare is going to work so the next thing to really talk about and try and get our brains around is the stack um, it's a real important part of how the you know programs work and what they do and how they deal with things because you can't have an entire object necessarily go running through the processor at some given point. It's got to have different parts of different things stored in different areas. And that's where the stack comes really useful, just pushing, you know, information onto it and popping it back off when needed. 
Um, I think it's best to think of the stack just basically, you know, it's an actual stack of information. Um, I often hear it referred to as a stack of paper even, you know. And so when you push something on the stack, you actually put something on the top. Um, and as you stack up more stuff, it's just, you know, to access the lower stuff, you'd have to go lower to be able to get to that. Um, and then when you start popping stuff off, you actually pop it off the top. And it's, you know, it's you're doing an injection, you've got to make sure you push it on in the right order and push it off in the back and you know, in the right order as well, which will often kind of almost look backwards. And in this sense, you can actually use the stack to push values around without even touching a registry. Um, obviously, there's really not a scenario where you're going to do it quite like this, but because even this, you could literally just do a move, would do the exact same thing, but but ultimately that's what you want to, you know, understand is you can just push and pop and push and pop and that's all you're really doing is just storing stuff and taking it back off later to get it back to the state you want it at. Um, that's really useful for when you need a registry so you can just do like a push EAX and then when you're done with it, pop EAX or RAX or whichever one you pushed. So, some other things to talk about with the stack, um, you can even use it to store your flags. This way, if there's a compare before you want to do a compare, you can store it and reset it. So, to store it, we'd want to do, if we were on a 16-bit process, push F is all you need. And that actually pushes, you know, the 16, you know, the full 16 bits of the flag registry on there. Uh, registries got larger as the years went on, so, you know, just like the, um, going from just AX to EX to RAX is the same kind of concept but then we've got push FD for the extended registry size or 32 bit size um, and then for 64 bit it's just push FQ and then of course to pop it back off we've got pop F and then pop FD and then pop FQ And so if we were actually writing our injection and we had our injection point somewhere um, when we wanted to store some stuff we can actually store all registries with just a pop AD but that really only stores 32 bit um, there isn't an equivalent in 64 bit there's, it just, just doesn't have that um, and then of course pop AD would be cleaning it back up so if we were actually to write that in somewhere and we were just wanting to use one or two registries and let's say we're on 64-bit. So then we might do a push RAX and then have whatever instructions we're going to have. Um, and then after that go ahead and pop RAX. Um, show it as a little more complicated. Let's say we wanted to check our flags. So we have push FD, or well, 64 bits, let's make sure we use push FQ, and then that's where we want to remember the last on, first off, or first on, last off, um, and that's where you would actually put it down lower, or in the opposite order that you pushed it on, and actually pop FQ back off to clean everything back up. Um, it's real important to remember to get that order right because otherwise you don't put stuff back in the right place and then you'll usually just get a crash more or less and then back over here we've got some basic examples um, just kind of showing you what happens when you push something on where it's going where it's stored and so on and so forth you can actually do this and cheat engine yourself and just kind of set up a, a dummy deal to test it out and see what it looks like but this just kind of illustrates the, the first on, first off, or first on, last off. But you can kind of see, like down here, where that first one we pushed on is all the way down at the bottom, and then it kind of goes up from there. So the next thing to talk about is AOBs. Um, basically, they're just a array of bytes. It's nothing real complicated. It's not so much for the process, it's more for finding stuff. 
from the aspect of wanting to do code injections and things of that nature. Um, it is kind of important to understand that an AOB is on some levels is often viewed as you know the full array of bytes in its entirety whereas if you start using wild cards which cheat engine takes and most stuff that really deals with array of bytes is going to take um, at that point you're kind of talking more of a signature um, and you'll even hear that term used a lot but at the same time I know I'll often just say AOB and still give a signature in the end so it not really a big deal but it's just something to consider especially to know when somebody says signature you'll understand they're talking about an AOB but specifically one that's going to have wild cards that deal with changes in an instruction um, there's a lot of different views on how to do a good signature uh, I can't really say I have a good one mine's more lazy and I just have my own code that pulls off the first freaking bite of the instruction based on how cheat engine actually breaks it up and shows it um, and that's just, yeah, to me, it was just easier at the time. Um, really, even I've got to admit, I've had plenty of times where one of my AOBs that look like this breaks on an update. And then the thing that finds it right off the bat, no problem, is actually just pulling this AOB right back off of there. And it's, you know, it still works. And so a lot of times the default AOB that Cheat Engine gives you will actually work great for about the only thing to keep in mind, especially when you get into larger games, they can a lot of times have different repeated stuff, so you might actually want to do a, a scan to double check and make absolutely sure that you've only got one instruction, or at least that what it finds is the first instruction. Um, I even actually didn't put it here, but I would also recommend checking copy on write just because when you actually do AOB scan or AOB scan module, it, it, it's searching everything. It doesn't really care. So it'd be good to know if you actually do have a copy on write instruction that's before the instruction you found, because that would be where it's going to inject is that first one it finds. If you um, use Lua, it does actually give you a little more options, but uh, I won't go into that, at least not yet. So we've kind of got a code example here, um, and it's using AOBs. So if you wanted to actually use like AOB scan module, you can put some, you know, the address in. Um, um, but AOB scan module is more just more modern stuff that you know it's modular based. So it has to be modular based, so or else this won't really get you anything. But that way you can search within a specific area of the process and not have to search everything that's loaded into memory. Um, this can make it a lot quicker on if you're having slow with just regular AOB scan, but of course the standard AOB scan still works pretty well in both scenarios, especially on 32-bit processes. Um, I guess I should mention at least here, doing this isn't really doing you anything. Um, wild cards at the end, it's just it's going to keep going through that string when it could have just ended up here so it's not really it may be less efficient it could be the same thing um, I don't know how DARPA I actually set that up but it may ignore that kind of thing make it a little faster but it could definitely make it slower if it doesn't not by much necessarily but so that's kind of the end of this tutorial thanks for watching hope you learned something Hopefully the yums didn't drive you crazy like it did me editing, but I'll try and figure that stuff out as I go along. We'll see what happens.